We have the last lecture by uh, Ron Donaghy from UPenn, who will tell us more about the geometric Langmans conjecture and non-abelian Hodge theory. Thank you again. <coughs> Thank you again. So um, I'm going to take five minutes or so to review what has transpired in the previous two talks, especially since there are a number of new people in the audience. Um, I don't know how intelligible it'll be, but I'll try to do it quickly. And then I want to, talk, to show you two slightly different approaches to, act, to, to proving the geometric Langmans conjecture. So um, the goal of the series of talks was to explain what the conjecture was and related to various things, especially Hitchin system and non-abelian Hodge theory. And it's all work with Tony Pantev and Carl Simpson. As I explained in the first case, Geometric Langlands is the non-abelian version of an abelian case, which is well understood. It goes under the name of geometric class field theory, not conformal field theory, uh, which is basically the theory of a curve and its relation to its Jacobian. And uh, as I explained, the, the, the abelian case is fairly elementary, and I gave two, two actually, actual proofs of it, and both proofs fit on one page. So it's not very hard. Uh, so all the interest is in the non-abelian extension. Uh, another thing I was pointing out was that the version in terms of the Jacobian was a little unnatural. It becomes more natural when you replace the Jacobian by the Picard, the Abel Jacobi map by the tensorization operation, which gives you a map from the Picard cross C to pick. If you fix a point in Picard, it gives you the Abel Jacobi map from C to the Jacobian, but it gives it in a way that's that does not require the choice of a base point. So the geometric Langlands is the attempt to extend these classical ideas from the abelian group C star to all, of complex, to all complex reductive groups G. And uh, the, so what you do is you replace the Jacobian by the moduli stack burn of all principal V bundles. The structure group is not the original G, but it's Langlands dual. The analog of the Abel Jacobi map is no longer a map, it's a correspondence, just a sub variety of the product. And here is what it is it's the set of triples V, V prime, and X, such that there exists a beta, which is an isomorphism from V to V prime. It's allowed to blow up at the unique point X, has to be defined everywhere else. So basically, Heke is a set of all modifications of the given V prime is going to be the set of all modifications of V based at the point X. And I pointed out that, the, that in the case of, uh, in the abelian case, this recovers exactly the average Jacobi map. For bigger groups, there are various issues. The thing that I'm defining is not really a variety, but an in scheme, so you need to truncate it. The different ways of truncating it are indexed by the dominant weights. So you get not one Hecke operator, but a whole bunch of them. Fortunately, as I tried to explain, they form a commutative algebra, so we can talk about simultaneous eigenobjects for the whole algebra, and those are the automorphic sheaves, those are the things that are predicted by Langmans. So the conjecture says that starting with an irreducible geolocal system on the curve C, it should determine a perverse sheaf or a local system on open subset of BUN, which is a simultaneous eigensheaf for the action of the Hecke operators. There's a conjecture in its basic form, and there's a fancier version which we cast it as an equivalent of two derived categories. One is coherent sheaves on lock, the modular space of local systems, and the other is the, the, the derived categories of D modules on bundles for the Langlands dual groups. I'm reminding you of that with the L superscript. And it's uniquely characterized by the property that if you apply it to the simplest objects here, the ones where the complex of sheaves is just a sheaf, in fact, the structure of a sheaf of a, of a smooth point of lock, 
that's the case that was discussed there, and that should go to the Heck eigenschiefs. So this correspondence that works on points should extend to correspondence on, on coherent sheaves. I think the general feeling is that this is the heart of the matter. The heart of the matter is how to construct automorphic sheaves on bun. If you can do that, then the, the extent, the, the, then it's basically a bunch of formalities to extend it to the derived categories. So I'm going to focus only on the basic case. I talked a bit about the relation, the hypothetical relation between geometric line lengths and homological mirror symmetry. I'm not going to review that today because I'm not going to use it at all. Instead, I'm going to use the abelianization approach. So um, we we'll, we'll work with the space with a modular space of Higgs bundles on which we have the Hitchin integral system. Hitchin studied this modular space and found an integral system on it. So there's a map little h from Higgs to a base b. Uh, it's the same one that's appeared in so many of the talks this week. Uh, b is a let me just write it, write what it is in the case of GLN. So I goes from 1 to R, which is the rank of the group G. H naught on the curve C of powers of the canonical bundle. The power is di, when the d's are the elementary, the degrees of the elementary symmetric functions. So in the case of type, in the case of GLN, V is summation, I going from 1 to N, H naught, C, K to the I. The DIs are just I's in that case, and they're, they're a little more complicated for other groups. For SLN, you'll just have the sum from 2 to N, and so on. So I, do, I told you about a result that Tony and I proved that says that, at least on the Zorisky open subset, on the complement of the discriminant in the base, the Hitchin systems for a group and for its Langlands dual group are T dual to each other, meaning that the bases are canonically identified. The fibers are abelian varieties which are dual to each other. They're typically not principally polarized. So the dual of the abelian variety is not isomorphic to it, but it's isomorphic to the fiber for the Langlands dual group. So um, we're constantly playing off these two Lagrangian vibrations. So this one, one space Higgs it has a symplectic structure. The Hitchin map is one Lagrangian vibration, meaning all the fibers are Lagrangian. But Higgs can also be interpreted as the cotangent bundle of bun, and therefore you have the natural projection to the base. And this is another uh, Lagrangian vibration. And the interaction between them is very interesting. So for example, you can ask, what's the intersection number of a fiber one way? So here is Higgs. Here are the two projections. One is B and the other is Bun. Let's say this is Bun and this is B. So a fiber over a point here is going to be some sort of a, an abelian variety. Fiber over here is just a linear space. You can ask what's the number of intersection points. It's the same as the degree of the map from Higgs to B cross bun. Take a point in B and a point in bun and ask how many points map to both of them. And in the case, let's say, of uh, GLN, it's going to be 2 to the power 3G minus 3, 3 to the power 5G minus 5, up to 
r to the power 2r minus 1, g minus 1, which I'm sure is exactly what you would have guessed, or maybe not. Um, how do you get that? Well, you're just fixing a point in the base, and you're asking, right, so fixing that means you fix g linear functions, 3g minus 3 quadratic functions, 5g minus 5 cubic functions, and so on. You're asking how many points of intersection do they have, and just bazoo, just tells you that it's the product of the degrees. So it's not that surprising. But it's, 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 it's not a number that comes up naturally. So one thing that was in the literature in the old days, I think it actually comes from the non-geometric story, is that if you start with a rank one local system and you do geometric language, what do you get? A rank one local system, which restricts under Abel Jacobi to the one you start with. What happens if you start from a rank two local system? You do not get a rank two local system. You get something which is, first of all, a perverse chief. It's not really a local system, but on the locus where it is a local system, it has rank two to the three g minus three. If you start with a local system of rank R, the expectation is that that number should be the rank. So the rank of the sheaf that the geometric Langlands predicts for you happens to be the degree of the Hitchin system defined in this, the, the intersection number of the two Lagrangian vibrations. So the geometry of these two vibrations seems to be a crucial ingredient of the story. So the last thing that I explained last time was that the Hecke operator H from bun cross bun to cross C has an abelianized version, H tilde, where instead of bun you take Higgs, and instead of a pair of bundles that are a modification of each other at the given point, you take a pair of Higgs fields, Higgs bundles, where the underlying bundles are modified at the point, and the Higgs fields are compatible. There's a little commutative diagram that, that takes one to the other. And that has the feature of replacing, instead of the fiber of the Hecke correspondence over a given point of bundle C being a Grassmannian, all the Hecke modifications that are possible for a given bundle, instead it becomes a finite set of all subspaces that happen to be invariant under the, the Higgs field. So you're getting a, a finite version of the, of the theory. And in, in the paper with, with Pantev, we construct a Bielanized Hecke eigenschiefs basically as direct images of degree zero line bundles on the HN fibers. Okay. So, um, yeah, let me leave that for a moment there. So, um, here is a naive way to think about it, which I've never been able to make work, but I've always been fascinated by it, and I always feel that it's the simplest way to think about what's going on. Um, we start, ouch, We start with a curve C in a local system L. So let's say for simplicity, rank R local system on the curve. And out of that, we're trying to manufacture a demodular perverse sheaf on bun. How are we going to do that? First step. Choose a spectral curve, C tilde over C. In other words, choose a point, fix a point of the Hitchin base, i.e., fix a point B in the Hitchin base, and C tilde is just the, the spectral cover defined by it. So in Jacques' talks, you already saw some examples of how you, you write those, those equations. Okay. L, so, so let's call this map pi. 
L is going to be pi lower star of some L tilde. L tilde is going to be a rank one thing on the spectral cover. What am I saying? You have a curve C, and on it you have a vector space at each point. Ignore the ramification. Take a, take a point in the base over which you have indistinct points of the spell cover. So you have n eigenspaces, n one-dimensional eigenspaces. You get a decomposition of your vector space as a sum of these n lines. So that just says that L is the direct image of a rank one thing on the spiral cover, which, where the fiber of L tilde is the, co the corresponding eigen, eigen line at each point. The only problem happens, to, happens at the ramification points. Um, L tilde is a line bundle. I need to write larger, right? The line bundle on C tilde, together with a connection. How do I get the connection? Well, the, I said it was a line. I think of it as sitting inside the vector space. The connection moves it to the vector space, and I project back to the, to the line. The problem is that nabla, uh, I guess I should call it nabla tilde, is no longer holomorphic. It's meromorphic. Its residue equals a half at each point of the ramification locus of pi. So it's... It's a connection everywhere except at the ramification points, but at the ramification point, there's a local, local holonomy of order two. The, the two sheets get the change, and that, that's reflected by the fact that the connection you get is meromorphic with, with a non-integer residue. A re, an integer residue would say that after some Hecker transform, you get, you get a holomorphic connection, but you don't because this is half integer. So you need to fix that. And fix this. So this is slightly technical, but basically you observe that the ramification is linearly equivalent to you start with the canonical bundle of C, pull it back to C tilde, and there's some degrees. Okay, over, it's some power of that. I'm assuming that the ramification is, 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 is the simplest ramification, yeah. Yeah, I mean, for more complicated ramification, it's always going to be a multiple of a half. So, yeah, for simple ones, a half, if, if, if two of them have co coincided, then it'll be... It, it could accidentally be an integer. Anyway, so uh, it happens, that, happens to be true that the ramification happens to be some power. So therefore, there exists a function f, meromorphic function on C tilde, such that the divisor of f is a multiple of pi upper star k c minus uh, ramification. It has zeros on one and poles on the other. And then you, the, the natural thing to do is to replace delta nabla tilde by nabla tilde plus half log, sorry, uh, half d log of this f. D log f is something that locally looks like dz over z. It has residue 1 at each of the zeros and minus 1 at each of the poles. I multiply it by a half, and I add it up. That kills all the residues at the ramification points, and instead it creates residues at the points of some device, okay, see. So fix once and for all. A divisor, an effective divisor, D, such that 2D is K. Fix what's called a, an F, 
an odd theta characteristic on the, on the curve, or uh, an odd sp spin structure on the curve. And once you do that, that allows, so, so instead of kc, you're getting twice d. And therefore, you've converted the ramification points to an even multiple of this divisor d, and therefore the half disappears. So now this, this, this new thing that nabla tilde modified has only integer residues. So by making a Hecke modification at the, point, at the point of this fixed divisor, you can actually get an honest connection this way. So after a little song and dance, what we did was we started with a, with a connection, a local system on C, and we got an abelian connection on C tilde. So the next step would be use abelian geometric Langlands conjecture, also known as geometric class field theory. The things that I worked out for you in the first talk, right? That gives you C of L tilde. That was the notation I used. So given a local system L tilde on the curve, Langlands predicts C of L tilde should be the perverse chief. In this case, it's just a local system on the Picard of the spectral cover C tilde. The Picard of the spectral cover C tilde is going to be this thing, the fiber of Hitchin over the given point in the base. OK. So then push down to bun. You're starting with a local system of rank 1 on this abelian variety. You push it down to bun, you get a get a meromorphic local system on bun, whose rank is the degree of this map, which is this number that I wrote somewhere, which is the predicted rank of the, of the automorphic shift that we need. So is this the right object? It can't be, because it, depended on, it depends on a choice. The choice we made was we chose a point of the base. So what I've really constructed is not one local system on the base, but a family of local systems, normal local systems, parameterized by the Hitchin base. If you, so you can think of, so you can say that what we've really constructed is a rank one local system on the total space of Higgs. But that's not what we constructed. We've constructed a line bundle on the total space and a connection on it whose curvature vanishes on each fiber. But that doesn't say that the curvature vanishes on the whole thing. In fact, if you do the calculation, you see that the curvature of this line bundle, of this connection on the line bundle, is essentially the, the symplectic form. The Higgs, the Higgs moduli space is, is hypercalar. In the holomorphic structure we're dealing with, it has a natural symplectic form from being the cotangent bundle of bun and you're getting that symplectic form. So it vanishes on each Lagrangian, but it's not necessarily zero on the whole thing. So you didn't get the local system on the whole thing, you got some curved thing. Anyway, the, so what you need to do is figure out a way to average these local systems over the hatred base. For each point of the, of the base, we got a local system the one that Langlands predicts is somehow you need to figure a way of doing the integral over, over the base and defining this. So I've never been able to, to really make sense of the right way to, to average those um, until I learned of the of non-abelian non Hodge theory, and that seems to be just the right tool for doing that. So I'm going to change the language a little bit, but you'll hopefully recognize that I'm, that I'm trying to use non-abelian Hodge theory to make sense of this averaging process. Yeah? I have a local system on this thing. 
which is, which is the Jacobian or a component of the Picard of the speckle cover. And it's, it really, it's really the frame of the speckle cover. That maps to burn of finite degree. I push forward by that map. So the rank one local system here becomes a rank two to the three, gmr three, and so on, local system down on bun. With funny behavior on the branch locus and possibly on some other loci where things blow up. The objects we're trying to construct are perverse sheaves. The nice thing about perverse sheaves is that they're generically defined. In other words, if you have a perverse sheaf or in a space, take any Zoyski open subset of that set, of that space, which is small enough so that your perverse sheaf is locally free or it's a local system on it. So throw away all the singularities, and throw away anything additional that you want. Just keep some small open subset. That, there's enough information in that to uniquely recover the original perverse sheaf. The original perverse sheaf is still the, the middle perversity extension of that local system. So, in, the, so in that sense, you're free to throw away all the singularities. You, you just want to construct a local system on some risk open subset. You, you really try to represent to construct some representation of the fundamental group of something. That, that's all you need. All right. So, okay, so I, 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 I told you a little bit about non abelian Hodge theory, and we've heard about it in detail from Uchizuki. Uh, he, here are the results that, that I actually need. So, um, the projective case, or combined Kähler, is, is uh, Simpson's result, and so is the one-dimensional punctured case, and then Mochizuki extended that to arbitrary dimension. Okay, so um, the low side that we run into, the, that, that, the, the main one is the, the thing that, that I call the wobbly locus, which I, I tried to, exp to explain last time, but maybe we need a picture. So uh, wobbly means stable, but not very stable. Very stable is this technical notion of Le Mans that says that the only nilpotent Higgs field on the given bundle is the zero nilpotent. And Le Mans shows that that's a non-empty Zoyski open condition, and it implies being stable. Okay, so bundle is very stable if only nilpotent Higgs field is zero. In other words, the two, the, the two Lagrangian vibrations intersect just at one point. Very stable implies stable. A bundle is wobbly if it's stable, but not very stable. A bundle is shaky if it is stable, but there's another stable bundle, V prime, in a Higgs field over it, which may, such that um, the pair becomes equivalent to V. I'm, I'll, I'll say that in a little more detail in a minute, but let me just give you the picture. This is what a wobbly bundle looks like. Yeah. I'll, okay, let, since you're asking, I'll, I'll write it in a little more detail. It's, it's going to be in the notes in a second. So this is not in the stacky world, but in the geometric world. At some right, the, the conjecture lives on stacks. non abelian hodge theory lives in geometry. So at some point, we, go, we need to go between them. So in the geometric world, the map from Higgs to Bern is only a rational map. It's not a morphism. By general nonsense, there exists some blow up, let's say Higgs tilde of Higgs, such that the map becomes a morphism on this bigger thing. Inside here, there will be some exceptional locus. Everything here that does not map isomorphically to everything that got blown up. Okay? So take the image of E. 
of the exception locus here. So that means you're looking at bundles here, which, well, they're in bunds, so they're stable, but they also come from something in the exceptional divisor. That means from some other bundle, V prime, where, v, where the, the original map was not well defined. That means that V prime was not stable, but V prime together with some Higgs field maps to it. It's, it's a complicated thing to understand. What do I say over? The last one. Yeah. So I really mean for, for this blown up map. So there's something that map, maps it, or if you want, there's a, there's a degeneration coming into it where the limit will be it. Okay. Yes, so. Yeah, so the question marks, those are the shaky buttons. No, no, um, we, we, we believe that they're always going to be the same. And in the cases that Tony, what Tony is going to do next week is he's going to show you in concrete geometric cases what the wobbly locus is, what the shaky locus is, and show you that they're the same. So this gives you, the shaky locus is the stuff where the map is not defined. The wobbly locus is an intrinsic characterization of that, of, 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 of that locus. Okay, so, um, okay, well, I've already explained what shaky is. So, okay, so here quickly is, are the statements that I need for non-abelian Hodge theory. There's a functor non-abelian Hodge, goes from finite rank complex local systems on X to finite rank OX1 semi-stable Higgs bundles on X, which is vanishing first and second churn class. Oops. If you start with an X, which is a smooth, complex, projective variety, so it's compact, but you remove a divisor D. So let D be an effective divisor. I think we need to assume that it's of normal crossings, or you can have a bad locus Z of co-dimension three, such that X minus Z is smooth, and D minus Z is normal crossing divisor. So you don't care about a small locus. Then there's canonical equivalence of differential graded tensor categories. I'm still calling it non-abelian hard, but now it's on X and D. For finite rank, tame parabolic C local systems on XD, finite rank, locally abelian, tame parabolic X bundles. There are a lot of words here, but I think Mochizuki has already explained all of them, which are semi-stable and satisfy that the parabolic churn classes vanishes, vanish. In order for this to work, there are three conditions we need. One is that the, it's a good compactification. That, means that away from co-dimension three, we have normal crossings. Then a local condition, which is the tameness, which basically says that the Higgs field is allowed to have at most logarithmic poles along the divisor, and some compatibility of the filtrations. And a global condition, which is the vanishing of the parabolic churn classes. So if you have these three conditions, then you can plug them into the machine. The last result that I need to use is Mochizuki's extension theorem, which I think of as a non-abelian version of what I was telling you a minute ago about perverse sheaves. A perverse sheaf can be restricted to any open subset, and there's enough information there to uniquely recover the perverse sheaf of the whole thing. Well, a similar result holds for in, in the non-abelian setting. So, let's say U is a quasi-projective variety, and we have X and Y that are two different compactifications of it. So X and Y are projective, irreducible. X satisfies the normal crossing condition, but we don't need that for Y. Then we can start from X, restrict to U, and do the middle perversity extension to Y. That gives an equivalence of, of abelian categories from irreducible tame parabolic local systems on X, to simple D modules on Y, which are smooth on you. So basically, 
this tells me that the, the theories on X and Y are essentially equivalent as long as they contain a Zorisky open subset. I'm oversimplifying it a little bit because we need to get to lunch. Um, the way I'm going to apply it is going to be one of these spaces is going to be the geometric compactification of X bundles, and the other will be the stacking compactification. And there's a common Zorisky open subset where the things are stable and automorphism free, so the, the stack and the geometric object look the same. But these are two very different ways of compactifying it. So that's the context where I'm going to be applying that. So, the, the, so here's the plan. We're going to, we're, we're starting from a local system and trying to spread it out using the abelian Hodge, the, the abelian case after conjugating by non abelian Hodge theory. So we started with the local system on the curve. Use Hodge, non abelian Hodge theory to convert it to a Higgs bundle on the curve. Use the, use the abelian case of geometric Langlands to spread that over the, the, the spectral Jacobian. Push that down, more or less as I did in the elementary version over there. Now we end up with something on burn, and we need to use the higher dimensional version of Hodge theory to, to twist that Higgs bundle back to a local system. So let me just try to explain the steps more carefully. And, oh, I just wanted to point out that even if we started with a curve with no punctures, the situation, yes. No, I'm, I'm doing it on bun. And the problem is that, the, that in bun, I have a bad locus, even if I started with a theory that, was comp that didn't have any punctures. And that bad locus is the, the, the wobbly locus. So I'm getting a, parab a parabolic theory rather than the, the, the I'm getting the, parabol the parabolic story even in the unpunctured case. So this is what I'm saying here. The, Situation is essentially non compact. We're working on bun. Uh, the S says you're looking at the stable points. So if you're looking at the open set of stable bundles, there's a locus, uh, there's a locus of shaky bundles along which our, the Higgs field blows up. That just says that this map somehow wasn't well defined there. And, and it, it, it goes back to, to the basic distinction between Higgs and the cotangent of bun in the geometric setting. Someone had a question? Or yeah, instead of averaging, I make sense of that by using non abelian Hodge theory. But, but you, but, the you can do that while keeping the point in the basic. Yeah. There is no averaging. I mean, this is not a literal okay. translation. This is the way to get around the issue that I, I didn't know how to, to do without the Hodge theory. It's not literally a, an average procedure. So, um, in the geometric setting, as I keep saying, the cotangent of Bun is contained in Higgs as the risk open subset, but there is a locus un of unstable bundles. So those stable Higgs bundles where, where the underlying vector bundle is not stable, unstable. And in order to turn this projection into a morphism, the unstable locus must be blown up to some exceptional divisor, unhat. Unhat is what I was calling E in that picture. And then the Higgs, the Higgs field part phi of the Heckagen chief on on the stable bun blows up along the image S of N. So S is going to be the shaky locus, the image of, of unhat. Unhat is the exception locus, S is the shaky locus. So the heart of the matter is to show that in this particular situation, Muchizuki's three conditions hold. So let me go through the steps of the program. So we start with a G local system. So I'm converting that to, or think of that as a vector bundle and a connection now, and this is on the curve. First step, I convert that, oops, okay. I convert that to 
a Higgs bundle on the curve. This is just the Colette Simpson one dimensional version of non abelian Hodge correspondence. Okay, so we understand that. Second step we convert the Higgs bundle, on the, we spread the Higgs bundle from the curve to the moduli of Higgs bundle. So I'm converting a G Higgs bundle on C to an abelianized Hecke eigenschief on L Higgs. That's what was done in the paper with Tony. So it sends a Higgs bundle E theta to some Fourier Mukai transform of it. But this is the Fourier Mukai transform for coherent sheaves on the cotangent bundle of bun. So basically, what we show is that Higgs and Higgs L, the Langlands dual Higgs, are T dual to each other, which means that there's a Poincare sheaf on the, take Higgs and Higgs L, they map to the same base. And on the product, there's going to be a Poincare sheaf, which gives you the duality between an abelian variety and its dual. So you use that Poincare sheaf as the, as the kernel of this integral transform. It's supported on, fi on the fiber product of the Torrigian vibration. So that gets us to step two. Step three, we want to convert the Hecke eigenschief on Higgs to a parabolic Higgs sheaf on L bun, where the, the, the parabolic divisors are basically the branch locus and the wobbly locus. And we need to check that they satisfy these three conditions. This is the part that we don't know how to do in general yet. We know them in special cases, and that's what Tony will be doing for you next week. Okay, so we'll accept that as a black box. Step four, once we have this thing on burn, we convert the Higgs chief to a local system. That is non-abelian Hodge on the higher dimensional object burn. So the picture is we're thinking of bun as the basic space, and it has a spell cover, which is the Hitchin fiber. So that picture uh, over there is, is now reinterpreted as a spell cover in higher dimensions. So uh, you have to talk about some stacks of semi-stable bundles, rigidify them, ne never mind the details, but we're basically applying the non abelian Hodge theorem to this pair consisting of uh, projective variety. We, yeah. So, 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 so let's say that technicalities that will be dealt with after lunch or next week. Okay, so now given some parabolic local system on BAN, we are restricted to a very scope and subset of stable objects, and so that's just restriction, and extend it by middle perversity to D module on the actual stack. So go, step five and six together are essentially, which is Oki's extension theorem. Yeah, it's roughly a push forward, but um, you have to show that it works. Sorry, so, um, no, no, I, it's fine. I, it's, it's fine. The, so basically what Tony is going to be talking about is the following three papers. Uh, there's a paper with, with Tony and with Carlos Simpson. We study operations on Higgs bundles. So natural operations such as pullback and direct image with respect to amorphism are well defined for harmonic bundles and for local systems. They're well defined and they commute with the non-abelian Hodge correspondence. For Higgs bundles, pullback is okay but it's not completely clear how to do the direct image. So main go goal of this first paper is to give an algebraic definition of direct image for Higgs bundles and to show that this thing is correct in the sense that it commutes with a non-abelian Hodge correspondence. So
So the case where y is a point is as a result of Zucker from 30 years ago. And we, we generalize this to, to families, although, truth be told, we have the, the full proof only when the fibers are one dimensional, which fortunately is exactly the situation that, that's going to come up in those examples. So if you work with the group SU2, the, the Hecke curves, well, the fibers of the Hecke, map, of the Hecke correspondence are going to be curves. They're going to be Hecke curves. That means they're one dimensional, and that's what we apply it to. So I'll be done in just one second. Um, so yeah, so we, we do this calculation. And in particular, this allows us to get a relationship between churn classes upstairs and churn classes downstairs, which is what we need to, to understand this push forward that you were asking. About. So yes, step three is about a push forward, but you have to show that it, it fits into the, the machinery. Okay, uh, and then there is there also applied in two specific cases. In a paper with Tony, we show, we analyze the case of P1 with five parabolic points. So in that case, the moduli space, as we already heard from uh, Saito and Inaba, is basically a, DP, a del pezzo surface, a DP5. It's what you get from the plane when you blow up five points. Well in some range of stability conditions, that's the answer you get. You get different answers in different ranges. Um, so there, the surface is the blow up of P1 at five points. On that, there are 16 lines. Those 16 lines are the shaky locus as well as the wobbly locus. So that's what he's going to show you explicitly. And, and then you can use that to write down ex explicit solutions of geometric lines conjecture in that case. So the case of P1 with four points is the only one where something similar has, had been done. That's a one-dimensional moduli space analyzed by Arinkin and Lysenko some, some time ago. So we're able to go to, I think this is the first case where the moduli space is more than one-dimensional, where, where one can write this explicitly. And then the, the other uh, case that we're looking at is where C is a curve genus 2 with no punctures, but there's still a wobbly locus that has to be eliminated. So that's going to be in, in, in a, paper, a paper with Carlos Simpson. So I don't, I don't want to say much more because I want to leave something for Tony for next week. So. Questions? Uh, so I want to know uh, what happened when you start from the parabolic local system. So you, you start from lo G local system. Right. When, what, what happened when so you start from parabolic plane? The, the main case that Tony is going to talk about is exactly that. So uh, this result. We started with P1 with five points. And we're looking at parabolic local systems with structure on those points. That's the moduli space we look at. That's the one that gives you the DP5. You use this uh, uh, moduli space of parabolic bundle not, uh, not to go, not only to go to the um, automorphic side, but that is the, the parabolic version of BAN. I think so, you, you are chart, uh, the, you are flow chart of geometric lang lang program. Uh, the parabolic bundle come uh, only the last part. So in this case, we have parabolic objects on both sides. We start with a parabolic bundle on P1 with the five points, and we get a parabolic bundle on the moduli space, which is BAM. In this other case, we start with something that's not parabolic. We still get a parabolic object on BAM. So that's the difference between the two cases. So you have different behaviors on the source, similar behaviors on the target.
Hypothetically, uh, what would be the problem if we found that the shaky and the wobbly lockers were different for some other example? It wouldn't be a disaster. You just have to. I mean, you'll just have to completely analyze the structure of this map. You have to figure out the right way to resolve it. So if if you did, yeah, if shaky shaky always contains wobbly. If if it contains both things, you'll just have to carefully blow, blow them up. And I mean, it will it will affect things like the calculation of the of the chunk classes of a direct image. In order for non abelian Hodge theory to apply, you need the churn classes downstairs to vanish. The churn classes downstairs are related to the churn classes downstairs, uh, upstairs by some push forward formula, which we work out in the paper with Simpson. But it, it depends on all the loci with, with, with the map that's funny things. So if you had more loci, that will change those formulas. And then you, you'll have to be lucky to, to, to get the chunk classes to vanish downstairs. More questions? If not, let's thank Ron again for the course. <laughs>